welcome to this network, Leadership Foundations. If you're here, it's because you're attending the forum for the first or second time. It's all relatively new to you. So let me just extend the welcome you've possibly just had in the plenary session as well. Welcome to the forum. It's really great to have you with us. And it's really exciting to have this opportunity to, to learn and to grow and to serve together. Christian leadership is right at the heart of healthy Christian church life and ministry life. And we long, don't we, to be more like Christ. We long to be transformed in our leadership so we can serve those in our care. And that's what this is all about. This Foundations Network is about setting the foundations for really good and godly Christian leadership. I'm going to commit our time to the Lord in prayer. So let's pray as we begin. Father, thank you for uh, the technology that allows us to meet in this way. We would long to be meeting in person, but we thank you that this is a, a really good alternative. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we're able to meet. Thank you we're able to connect with one another. Thank you we're able to grow together. And we pray that over these next four days, the inputs we receive and the work of your Holy Spirit might combine to help us to grow and develop as leaders. Father, we pray that we might begin and make some good friendships. We pray, Heavenly Father, that the inputs we receive will be just right and help us in our different situations and contexts. And we pray most of all, Heavenly Father, you will fill us with hope. Thank you for what we've just heard from Peter Williams, some of us, and, and heard how there is great hope because you are raising up leaders. Father, we commit ourselves into your hands and pray we might be those who are used by you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So let's just crack on. I think that's the best thing to do. And I want to introduce my friend, Greg. I've known Greg a few years now. And Greg, um, I'm going to see if I can get your title right. You're the president. Is that right? You're, you're, the, you're the president of everything here. The world, is it? <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's, it's great, Greg, to have you with us. One of the great privileges, actually, of this particular network is we've just got some of the, the top guys um, as part of the forum to come and speak to us. Um, for most of the sessions, and that includes the first session. So, Greg, it's, it's great to have you with us. So, Greg, over to you, brother. Great. Well, everybody should, in just a second, see a screen uh, that I'll be using, a PowerPoint screen, along with my talk. So if you have any, you know, uh, things you can't see or understand, we'll go ahead and go to it in more depth. But I want to welcome you myself. Um, it, it, this is a wonderful chance for you to, to get to know some of the leaders that are involved in the forum. And um, But this idea, actually, of this network came from Adrian. Adrian, as he mentioned, has been around for about three years. But after the first year, he said to me, Greg, there needs to be a network that introduces people to the vision of the forum, the experience of the forum. It's too many working pieces and things going on. And we need to find a way to help people introduce them. And I said, that's a great idea. Could you lead it? And he said, yes. <laughs> That's a good response to make to a leader that comes with a good idea is to say, get them involved with doing it because it was his. So this whole experience you're in experience this week is Adrian's idea. Um, I also want to just, you know, just give you a little bit of historical perspective on the forum before we get into any more kind of the details of, you know, the, the content. Um, the forum was created to serve leaders like you. At the heart of the forum, we really are, are, are trying to come alongside gospel leaders and find a way to serve you and find a way to help you to do what God called you to do. And the basic vision behind the forum is to unite, equip, and resource leaders. Um, that's the forum strategy. Uh, but to really understand that strategy, You've got to ask the question, why are we doing that strategy? Why are we doing what we're doing? And you're going to hear from six members of the steering committee. And you have to know that I'm obviously speaking with an American accent. For 20 years, I've been the only American on the steering committee. That's the group that actually makes the major decisions about the forum. Uh, what plenary speakers we have, I haven't made a single decision in 20 years. Or what uh, networks we start, that's a steering committee. This is the group of leaders that have shaped the vision. So you get a chance to interact with the leaders that have kind of shaped the form. So you can ask them tough questions. I really encourage you to do that. And four of those six um, leaders, we've been working together for 20 years. So this isn't a new thing. You know, we're, we're, we're involved in, in years, even decades now of working together, trying to serve leaders like you. 
But to understand that, you've got to go a step below it and to say the why question, the why is because we're convinced about certain convictions. To understand the form, you've got to understand these convictions. Now, the title of this talk should be how a biblical worldview shapes our teaching and leadership, but it also could be called form core convictions, because that's really what I'm going to be working on. Let me start with a question. Why did Jesus have John in Revelation write a different letter to each of the seven churches? Why not the same letter to all the churches? Because each church was different. The truth that that church needed to understand, what they needed to do in response was unique. This is a basic principle you find all throughout scripture. It's summarized in 1 Chronicles 12.32 from Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Understanding the signs of the time helps us to respond with specific context we're in with appropriate teaching and strategies. And for us, that's what we've been trying to do with the forum. We're, we're, we're convinced to establish effective teaching strategy. We have to understand what are the challenges? What are the needs? What are the issues that the church is facing today? And that's what we call defining reality or understanding the times. So the question first, before we go into the strategy or content, is to say, what is the context of the gospel church in Europe today? And the first thing is we are living in, in a world that is totally different than it was 120 years ago. Unbelief has gone from less than 1% of the world's population, that's atheists and agnostics, less than 1% to 15% in a, in a single century. I mean, that's a phenomenal growth of a belief system. And more particularly, that unbelief, 90% of atheists in 1900 started in Europe. And in 2000, 90 or 85 percent of the world's atheists were outside of Europe. In other words, so this is a, a belief system that's, that comes from Europe, shaped by European culture, and then dispersed through the educational system that Europe originated and now is being carried around the world. So to diagnose what we think of as the greatest challenge for the gospel today, it's not Islam, it's not Hinduism, it's not tribalism, it's unbelief. And to diagnose that, we have to understand its source and try to develop vaccines for it. So that's the first point. And uh, the second point is that the result of that first point is that the evangelical church in Europe has weakened. It's the only evangelical church in one of the, the continents that's gone down in the last decade, in the last century, rather. It's the smallest percentage of born-again believers uh, on any continent are found in Europe. Now, I want to give you two pictures of kind of what that meant. In, you know, when I was traveling around speaking at various seminaries and colleges 20, 22 years ago, I met a, a, a faithful, godly man who's the president of a denomination. And we talked about this. We talked about the struggle in Europe in general and his struggle in his denomination. And then he said this to me. He said, Greg, my job is to manage decline gracefully. And I, I just went, Wow in my spirit, I just was, wow, that, that's an amazingly honest, but also um, sad, lack of hopeful perspective. But it, but, it, but it was honest because that was been his experience for 55 years of his life. He'd been in a church that had been declining. And so he was trying to be faithful in the midst of a really difficult situation, but, but he didn't have hope for, or vision for a positive change. Then another example. About the same time, I, I was teaching in two countries, actually, one summer, and I met the leading Christian counselor in one country, and I met the leading Christian counselor in another country. The first was doing wonderful innovations of taking burned out pastors and bringing them back into ministry to be fruitful and effective. And the other one was his wonderful teaching on fatherhood and families, again, really effective and influential in the country. These two Christian counselors have been doing the same thing for 10, 15 years. They didn't know each other. Think about all the scripture that says about one another, how we're supposed to help one another, love one another, serve one another, encourage one another, pray for one another. All the one another's of scripture, you can't do any of them if you don't first know one another. In other words, these individuals could not help each other and they could not share the, what God had given them as best practice because they didn't even know each other. And so that's the world we've faced as the European leadership forum. We said we have a, a world that's uh, Europe that's struggling in the midst of this pandemic, spiritual pandemic of unbelief, and then secondly that we're divided. We're divided by country, by language, by culture, by denomination, and that we're convinced that gospel leaders need access to mentors and to peers, to best practices, to strategies, to resources. 
And another thing we also realized is that we were looking particularly for Caleb's. What do I mean by that? When Caleb saw the promised land, he wasn't like the 10 spies who were afraid. They said, we, you know, they're giants in the land. We, we can't do it. We, I mean, we're, we're not big enough. We're not strong enough. Caleb said, no, we can take the land. We're looking for leaders that's, that have a hope and expectation and eagerness to say, Lord can do something even in the midst of a very difficult situation. So that's kind of the big picture, laying defining reality or clarifying the times. Now, I'm going to talk here about something that's going to seem, of everything I say, it's going to seem odd to you. So just give me a few minutes to unpack it for you. We as evangelicals do theology in two ways. We typically preach or teach the Bible systematically, exegetically. We do that in churches. We do that in you know small groups and other. But we're basically teaching what the Bible says from the verses and, and the context of the Scripture and the letters. Second way we think theologically is we typically put all of that exegetical thinking into systematic theology. What does the whole Bible say about this topic? So we do. We do exegetical theology and we do systematic theology. Now, both of these are hugely important, crucial, necessary. They're absolutely fundamental. And, and we need to do those ways of how to think about scripture. That's, we're Bible people. But I would say we're missing part of how the Bible shows us we're supposed to communicate if we only think in those categories. I'm gonna give you two examples of Jesus and Paul. And both of them did the same thing. Both of them responsibly communicated the truth. Jesus taught the truth to people in terms of changing how he communicated it. It wasn't a canned speech that he read to each new crowd. Think what he said to Nicodemus. He said to you know, somebody in his, he had these fossilized categories, and he said, you must be born again. You know? And Nicodemus didn't understand, but it's the only time he uses the phrase born again in all the Gospels. You know, it, it, you have a very distinct word. The next chapter, he says to the woman at the well, you need to have living water. And he communicates in a way that's different depending upon where they are and what their issues are. And in Mark 12, 12, it says this, you know, when he's interacting with these folks who the scribes have hard hearts, Jesus responded by telling a parable that illustrated their hearts. And then it says this, quote, they knew he'd spoken the parable against them. He taught people where they lived. The truth didn't change, but the particular point of application did, depending upon the group or person Jesus was addressing, you know, understood in this way. It, Jesus was relevantly communicating the truth, and uh, if you think about that, his role was to glorify his Father, as ours is to glorify. Glorify means to reflect. Jesus was reflecting the character of his Father, and sometimes that means he's caring for the little children. Or sometimes he had a ministry of felt needs. You who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. But other times, he has a ministry of confrontation. When he talks to people of hard heart, who are not sincere, who are not faithful, who are not honest, he confronts them. He calls them whitewashed sepulchers. You know, those are places of death. And the Jewish people know what he means by that. He's, if you even touch that, 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 that gravestone, you're unclean. I mean, he had a ministry where he, you know, he, he part of it was consistent. He could overturn the tables and use a whip to clear the table, the temple of the money changers. I mean, is a very responsive communication depending upon the person or group that Jesus was facing. We see the same pattern of responsibly communicating the truth with Paul. Now, if you look just, just one chapter or one book, uh, the Philippians, I mean, what do you see in that book? In, in chapter four of the Philippians, you see Paul, he says, I plead with Eudea and Syntyche, two women who are strong women. And he said, I plead with you to agree with each other in the Lord. Why? Because they're not agreeing with each other in the Lord. In chapter two, he says, do everything without grumbling and disputing. Why? Because they're grumbling and disputing. In chapter two, he says, you know, be, have the heart, the, the humility of Jesus. Why? Because they're proud. Chapter one, he says, do everything with one spirit, one mind, one faith for the heart of the gospel, because they're not. They're, they're divided. This is a, a letter, the Philippian letter, written to a church that's in conflict. He's giving them instructions on how to be united. Now, compare that to what he did with the Galatians. You know, Galatians, right out of the gate, he, he calls them fools. You foolish Galatians, so quickly deserting the one who called you. In other words, it's a different letter with a different message. Same gospel, same gospel. You've got to realize Paul's word, a synonym for the gospel, is the word of truth. The truth doesn't change. But the way you communicate it does, depending upon the person that you're facing. And you see this same pattern all the way throughout Jesus' ministry and through Paul's. And, 
And so you apply that to today and say, okay, how do we apply this principle of responsibly res responding to the context that we just described in Europe today? What do we do? What do we teach? And the first thing we teach is apologetics. Now, you know, let's go back to Paul again, just to talk about what he did. It says in Acts 17, as his custom was, he went in the synagogue, explained to the Jews why Jesus was the Christ. But then when he talked to the Greeks, he quoted Greek poets, explained who the unknown God was. But in both of them, he's persuasively communicating the gospel as the word of truth in a way that different audiences comprehend it. It's persuasively communicating the, the word of truth to them. Apologetics is just this, this Christian communication, persuasive communication of the gospel. Science and art of Christian persuasion enables us to understand our partners in conversations, non-believers, and how to communicate them in a way that makes sense to them. So the early followers of Jesus did not appeal to faith as if it's a leap in the dark. No, they said the gospel is true. You know, what did, what did they say to Paul? You're seeking to persuade me? At the end of Acts, it says, so, yeah, you know, I persuade everyone would be like, like, like I am, because this is true. This is really true. They argued that Christianity, the gospel is true, and they call people to trust God. Now, because we're, we're facing a situation that's very much like Paul, a Europe that's this pagan, this relativistic, this pluralistic, you'd have to go 2,000 years for, for us to find a, a Europe that's very similar in the same way that ours, ours is to Paul's. And, and we're facing it, the same situation, and, and we need to persuasively communicate why the gospel is true. And that's why we do what we do. We have two apologetics networks, but we have apologetics in every nook and cranny in the forum. There are dozens of, of workshops on it explaining a Christian worldview to a world that doesn't believe it. Um, okay, so that's the first principle, the principle of apologetics. Next is the idea of importance of scripture for everything that we do. Why did the Roman, or what, why did the European church implode over the last century? Because it lost the foundational conviction that the Bible is the authoritative and true word of God. For, for us to see renewal happen, we've got to be convinced that the Bible provides that authoritative, true convictions from God, revelation from God, and because we approach everything from Scripture, every category. You'll go into workshops this week, and every outline will be talking about what a scriptural, biblical framework is for addressing that topic. Let me give you an illustration of what this means. Um, Rolf Hille, who's a um, theologian, he was the head or chairman of the, the World Evangelical Alliance's Theological Commission. He came to the forum several years ago, and halfway through the forum, he walks up to me and says, Greg, I know what you're doing. And I said, Rolf, what am I doing? I didn't know what he was talking about. And he said, you're creating a 13th century university. But instead of using Thomistic thought as the foundation, you, you're framing everything from a biblical worldview. And I said, you're absolutely right. That's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're, we are looking at any topic, psychology, leadership, politics, on say, how do we think of this from a biblical point of view? And I asked him to do a workshop on that. So you'll find that on our website, you know, the, the forum as a medieval university. Okay, everything we talk about in the forum is from that biblical framework. That's, that's what we're doing. So we're convinced the importance of emphasizing that. Next, it, it, there's an element of teaching that we don't think has been focused on enough uh, within the, the evangelical church, and that's discipleship and the idea of maturity in Christ. You know, the Bible teaches that we are saved through faith alone. We're justified through faith alone, but that biblical faith isn't alone. When Jesus teaches about the, the, how to be his disciple, like in the, in the parable of the sower and the seeds, what does he say? He does talk about the ways that individuals, you know, aren't, you know, the seeds that are stolen by Satan, the seeds that are dried up by difficulties, choked off by life's worries, riches, and pleasures. These are important dangers he identifies. We need to be wary of. But then he focuses on something we don't often focus on. That he says that the fruitful seed clings to the word and are teachable honest, faithful, and persevering. You cannot grow to maturity in Christ because these principles are not just in this parable, they're all throughout the New Testament. The importance of clinging to the word, that's Psalm 1, it just perfectly illustrates that. But you know, all the rest of them, being teachable, being honest, faithful, persevering, but all of this is, is based on who we are as sons and daughters. It's all rooted in that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. There's a danger of 
having discipleship be premature in a sense because we don't really understand the gospel if we're not responding to what god has done for us in the gospel you know it, it, we're not operating in our thankfulness and joy the gospel gives us the framework for understanding and living out the discipleship i've just described but all of this discipleship, all of this emphasis on the one another, as you'll discover in the form, is a response saying we will never see leaders grow without that one another environment. We will never see leaders grow to maturity unless there's clarity on the biblical model of discipleship. So these are central points that we're responding to today's context with is the biblical teaching on discipleship and maturity in Christ. Next is that you won't get very far in understanding the form if you don't understand the, the importance that we see the scripture teaches on leadership. When Jesus saw the fields ready for harvest, what did he say? He said, you know, they're ready for harvest. Pray for workers. You know, God's means to advance his kingdom are workers, are leaders. But we've let leadership become distorted in some ways. You know, I wrote a book on how people can be seduced by marketing. Because thinking about marketing is marketing is a way to communicate the gospel. We have to be wary of the cultural ways that we've been trained in and how to think about leadership. Biblically, we need to realize that there's a biblical way of doing leadership that's not the same as any as management or or psychology or therapy, you know, one to one or or the idea of, of this idea of marketing I've just described. But there's also another danger. And the other danger that we are under is that we have focused from our tradition from the Reformation, which is a wonderful, we stand in the history of the Christian. We're, we're confident in the truths that the Reformation rediscovered from God's word, that, that we're saved through faith alone, justified by faith alone, and the Bible is our authority. But the tendency has been in Protestant theology to think about leadership and equating it with speaking, that the, that the way somebody goes to seminary to become a, a Christian leader is to learn how to be a preacher. And biblically, biblically, that's just not true. Preaching is essential. Teaching is essential to Christian leadership. And in fact, it's the only ability that Jesus or that Paul clarifies is required for an elder. All the other characteristics are spiritual, moral, and relational characteristics. There's one, to teach or refute falsehood. It's essential. Think of it as like the thumb of Christian leadership. If, you know, but if you only have a thumb, you can't do much with your hand. If you only have the fingers, you can't do much. It's essential, but it's not equal to Christian leadership. But the heart of biblical leadership is this role of pastoring, the role of growing to maturity in Christ and helping other people to grow to maturity in Christ. And that's at the heart of the forum. You know, we, we, we are committed to this vision of helping people to flourish, helping you to flourish. That's what the forum's vision is, helping you to become who God wants you to be, helping you to become who you want to be, mature in Christ, using your gifts and your calling for God's glory. I mean, a number of years ago, we had a, a speaker who came to the forum and, you know, a world-class theologian, but he was unkind. He was rude, and we've never invited him back. The reason, you know, not that we're all broken, we're all weak, we all have weaknesses, but the importance of this is so crucial. We use it as a criteria to say, are we going to use that person as a speaker or not? They have to be modeling to some extent, we have loving God and loving people and be growing in that because that's what we're moving toward. Next. Now, all of this comes together is that we're a community of people with these convictions. We are, we are serving leaders and part of that is that we are coming with many distinctives. I mean, you'll have people this week that are that believe in infant baptism. Not that infant baptism saves the babies. They all believe that we're justified through faith alone. But there are people with differences that are be a part of the form. But those are what we call secondary differences. They're not central gospel biblical issues. You know, form leaders and speakers are chosen because they're spiritually mature. They love God, love people. They need to be effective leaders. And part of that is they need to be able to distinguish between a secondary and a primary issue. Okay, then this is the last principle, and then I'm getting into just for a few minutes on strategy. Yes, biblical truth needs to be taught, as I'll talk in a minute, effective strategies need to be implemented, but God are the two most important words in Scripture. We can do nothing without the Holy Spirit empowering us, convicting us, leading us, teaching us. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, we're coal without fire and trees without sap, and all that we do is dependent upon God. It's coming before God and saying, Lord, do a new work in us. I mean, I, I love this old, uh, actually a poem by Francis Schaeffer. He said, come try you and God who lives, shake this world again. You know, it's God, we're asking God to do a new work in us and through us. That's what we're longing for. Okay, all this leads up to strategy. I'm going to go much more quickly over this because we only have five minutes or so. 
what did the Apostle Paul, when he came to the new city, you know, go to the local synagogue? It says, it says, as his custom was, because that was an effective strategy at that time. It would not be effective today. There are not as many more synagogues in every town or village. And he was also Jewish, and most of us aren't. You know, he, he was using a strategy because it was effective at that moment, but, but he didn't do that same strategy when he talked to the Greeks. He referred to the unknown God. He referred to their poets. It's a very different strategy. The context changes the strategy they use. You know, it, it, you know even if you look back at Acts, when they received the Holy Spirit, they just received the Holy Spirit, and then they had a problem as a church. They had a, a conflict between the Grecian Jews and the Hebraic Jews over how their, their widows were being treated. What did the, did the apostles do? They said, we have a problem. We want to just distribute resources. So they developed a strategy. Seven men full of wisdom and Holy Spirit, they appointed them to administer it. In other words, strategy is just leading in a particular context, finding what strategies are effective. So briefly, what are our strategies? Number one is unite. You know, we can't live out the one another's if we don't know one another. Bringing leaders together to gain access to mentors and resources, that's what we're about. I mean, I was in about 20 years ago, I talked to presidents from, from across, you know, like five or six presidents in one country at one time. And in living memory, they had not seen a church plan in 30 years in their country. 30 years in their country, no church. Well, did they, did, did they have mentors in, uh, in practice, best practices and strategies, to, even not in their denomination, but out in their country? In other words, sometimes there's a value to look to where can you get access to somebody who's a little bit further on. They might be in, in Norway or in France or in Czech Republic or wherever they are. They might be in a different place than the country you're in. So we're creating an international context to unite biblical leaders. Second, we're trying to equip them and resource them. We are literally trying to be a bridge between them and God's global resource to find a way to help you to do what God's called you to do. It's designed to serve you, to give you what you need to do what God has called you to do. And to do that, we recruit people like Adrian and Ann. They're, they, they, would be, they could be so busy and so effective in their own work somewhere else, but they're giving a portion of their time and not just them, but another 120, 130 leaders are doing the same thing to, to be serving the rest of the body of Christ outside of their organization, outside of their church. They're finding a way to give to the rest of the body of Christ that's not helping their organization or church. You, your Bible teacher this week, you know, Pete Williams, if you came to the session, I mean, he's, a, he's an example of that. Some of the people you'll listen to in this network, Stefan Gustafson, Mike Reeves, Emmanuel T Tandrea, all of these folks are doing the same thing. They're, they're serving you trying to help you to do what God called you to do. All of this, though, is based on these two questions. What has God called you to do, and how can we help? We literally want to help. Now, we don't promise we're going to help, but, but our desire is to serve you and to help you to do what God called you to do. And most people realize that over time. 60% of the people who sign up for the form in a typical year sign up before a single program is online. Why? Because they know the form has been designed to serve them. They trust that we're there to try to help them to do what God's called them to do. Now, central, you'll hear this all through this week, but central to the form is it's not just dropping content on you. It's relationships. It's relationships. It's recognizing that there's a biblical model of discipleship, of mentoring, that we try to build into everything we do. You know, there'll be hundreds. Right now, there's 250 people that are signed up for one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions. That will go up. If you have not signed up for mentoring sessions one-on-one -on -one this week, oh, that's a loss. You've got dozens and dozens of leaders that want to love you, serve you, get to know you. Some of those relationships, you know, they last a long time. Most of them are just these one-on-one -on -one sessions. That's fine. But it's finding a way to connect with God's people. And one of those ways is through mentoring. Another way is through 28 different mentoring strategies, groups or individual mentoring strategies throughout this next year. They're launching. If you don't have a mentor and if you want to be helped and encouraged and equipped, pray through that list. Think through that list and see where God could lead you to connect with somebody that can help you do what God's called you to do. Okay. And then lastly, and this is an important point, is that the form is a place where everybody sacrifices. How is that? I've been talking about how we're serving you, how we're trying to equip you you know, come alongside you, but, and this is a big but, is a, you know, eventually after a couple years of doing that, we ask you to transition from being a consumer to being a contributor, from being a participant to being a partner. I'm going to give you a story just briefly. We had a, a young evangelist. Uh, I was told he was the best young evangelist in this country. He came to the forum, you know, for a year, loved it, and he came back the second year and 
applied and, and uh, he, he said, this is the best conference I've ever been to and, and uh, it really helped me so much. And we said, we were really glad it's been helpful, but we got to find a way to help other people now. We've been coming, you'll be coming for two years now, find a way to help other people. You take what the form's giving you, make that transition. The third year, he applied and he said the same thing. He says, you know, have you helped anybody? No, this has been the best thing for me ever. You know, I loved it. It was so helpful. And we said, we love, we're glad it was helpful, but you can't come back. Why do we say that? Why do we say you can't come back to something that's been so helpful? And he's an effective young evangelist because he wasn't committed to the form vision of passing on God's grace to someone. Find a way to bring somebody else to share what you've given, what can be given to you to, to share with somebody else. Find a way to use the form resource. Find a way to be involved in giving to the rest of the body of Christ what is being given to you. So that is an expectation. The expectation is we want to serve you, help you, help you to flourish, but we want you to eventually after a couple, two or three years to find a way to give to the rest of the body of Christ in your country, in your local context, in your regional context, whatever it is. We don't, we don't have a particular thing you have to do. We are trying to explain that there's a way for us to help you so you can help others. So conclusion for all this, the forum is designed as a spiritual fireplace of renewal. It's a bridge between leaders and God's global resources and it's guilds. Guilds are these networks. After this year, you have the choice of other networks. You might say, I really have a calling to be a Bible teacher. Well, we have a wonderful uh, leader and leaders that, to train you and equip you on how to teach the Bible more effectively. Or you might say, I, I really have a calling and ability to, to counsel people. Or I feel this burden to start a church. Or whatever it is, we, we have 25 networks that are little guilds, if you think of them, like a medieval guild where you'd be trained and equipped as an apprentice in that particular area. So all of these things are what we're doing here, and we're doing it because we're just des we're designed to help you. So I, I'm I'm trying to explain the convictions, but I'm also trying to apply what the topic was. The topic was how do we respond to the context we're in with teaching and strategy. So let me just pray just for a minute, and we'll pass it back to Adrian. Lord, I lift all this to you. I pray you might use it. I pray that it might be of you, and I thank you that you brought all of us here. That everybody's here is in your body and that we're your children. And Lord, thank you. And I pray you might encourage them and equip them. This might be a place of, of hope, refreshment, and a place where they can feel like they're not alone, but they're with your people. And we lift all this to you, Lord. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Oh, Thanks for listening, everybody.